Boston, Massachusetts had been a city like most others in the northeast of the United States. It had problems with crime like any other place, and it wasn't as if it was immune to having issues with fires either. As almost a century before, the Great Boston Fire had caused a huge amount of damage to the local infrastructure. On top of that, in 1977, almost 100 blazes had been set throughout the city, with these later being deemed to have started in an attempt to create insurance fraud. But while this had been a major headache for the fire department at the time, it was nothing compared to what was to come. Between at least February and November of 1982, things would reach another level altogether when an unprecedented 163 arson attacks were carried out on 264 buildings across the city, creating what was at the time considered the biggest arson case in American history. These cases would have nothing to do with collecting insurance, a fact which made it harder to pin down a culprit as there would appear to be no clear motive on the display. Needless to say then, this stretched the emergency services to their absolute limits, and also led to more than 270 firefighters being injured during the process of putting these blazes out. So it must have felt like the ultimate betrayal for them when less than two years later, it was determined that the culprits behind the whole thing had been none other than a group of disgruntled co-workers. This is Monsters. Before we can get into the reasoning behind why these men would carry out such heinous acts which put both of their colleagues and the general public at risk, we have to take a look at the economic situation in early 80s Boston. The presidential run of Jimmy Carter between 1977 and 1981 had been viewed by many on the right as being a failure, and this was largely a result of the fact that he was perceived by those on the Republican side as being weak and indecisive on important issues something that subsequently led to the economy beginning to stagnate. So, when Ronald Reagan was elected in 1981, it was a moment heralded by his supporters as the start of a new era for the country. After all, with his notion of trickle-down economics being one of his major platforms he was pushing while going across the election trail, those in the upper class felt like he was the man they needed to finally get things moving again. While his philosophy on economics did lead to many of the higher earners prospering as Wall Street boomed, a lot of people on the lower end of the economic scale soon began complaining they weren't feeling any of those supposed trickle-down effects. The feeling amongst a section of the country that weren't able to reap any of these rewards also applied to much of the public service sector as well with many emergency services in particular arguing that budgets were being stretched so tight it had left them unable to do their jobs properly. That said, the turn of the decade was already making a period of difficult transition for the fire department in particular as, with sweeping new technology changes altering the way they worked, and the looming threat of liability lawsuits now seeming to follow them at every turn, there was a lot of walking on eggshells as staff desperately tried to get to grips with new ways of doing things. This may be why there were so many disputes between firefighters and governing bodies at the time, and perhaps it's this growing culture which also led to things reaching the point that they eventually did. It should be noted that, while these public service programs may have gotten worse under the Reagan administration, it didn't begin there. In 1980, a full year before he was elected, the citizens of Massachusetts had already voted to pass Proposition 2.5, a law which placed a 2.5% limit on the amount of revenue communities could raise through property taxes. As it was argued by proponents of the bill at the time, the passing of this law would allow for a more fiscally responsible government as it would be forced to act more efficiently when it came to spending taxpayer money. On top of that, it was believed that this new normal would give more voter control as to what was going on in terms of school funding, something many were happy at the prospect of. On the other side of the coin, however, there were also concerns that such a bill being passed would inevitably lead to problems such as a reduction in social welfare, difficulty in people finding jobs, and a wave of reduced funding all over the state. Unfortunately for public services in Massachusetts at the time, this flip side would prove to be true as once Proposition 2.5 passed, 
it ended up severely hampering what they were able to do on a day-to-day basis. What was the specific reason for this? Well, as the Massachusetts Department of Revenue put it at the time, the property tax as it had previously existed was the largest source of revenue for most cities and towns in Massachusetts, and as such was used to help fund a number of local services like schools and public safety. So it should go without saying then that, with a significant decrease in funding being announced by the Boston mayor, Kevin White, soon after this, the fear of impending layoffs would run rampant throughout these sectors. In fact, early estimates were that roughly 650 police officers and 550 firefighters would lose their jobs as a result of the decision, reducing the amount of fire department companies in the city from 77 to 55. To add another wrinkle to the story, As a result of court-ordered diversification mandates, which meant that a certain percentage of the most recent emergency services staff hires had to be made up of minorities, such as African Americans, Asian Americans, and women, most of those who would be laid off during this period would be white males. Normally, the people who had most recently been hired would be the first one to be fired, letting the people with seniority keep their jobs. But since most recent hires had been people who had been brought in so as to try to address the diversity imbalance, it left the older staff, most of whom were Caucasian, out in the cold. While it may have been created with the best of intentions with the hopes of getting more minorities in the workplace, in this particular incident, the policy had left a number of workers feeling like they were being screwed over, with this only fostering resentment amongst them as a result. In 1982, there was a last-ditch effort to try to block the passing of Proposition 2 and a half, which was taken all the way to the Court of Appeals. But despite the hopes amongst the local workers of Boston being that a new administration in the White House with new philosophies on the economy would mean the decision would be overturned at the last minute, it turned out there was very little sympathy to be found for the emergency services of Massachusetts as the decision to limit their funding was deemed a state issue. As the result of this, it formally fell outside the purview of the federal government, and as such, those workers who were now being laid off were left feeling like no one was going to throw them a lifeline. In the end, a full 600 members of the Boston Fire Department would be let go as a direct result of Proposition 2.5, with this number making up over a third of the overall workforce and managing to exceed even the worst estimates which had previously been feared. That said, it wasn't as if nothing positive came from this appeal, because as a consequence of it, Massachusetts would quickly enact new legislation, which was supposed to help alleviate the issues by providing the city of Boston with additional funding. And this funding was specifically to be used to not only reinstate any and all police officers who had been laid off during the prior fiscal crisis, but also to provide security against them being let go as a result of budget cuts again in the future. Understandably then, this was deemed a huge win for public services in the city, particularly the fire department as, like we mentioned earlier, just a few years prior to this in 1977, Boston had found itself getting swept up in an arson spree, one which saw almost 100 buildings being torched over the course of that year, leaving the firefighters there having to risk their lives day in and day out so as to battle them. At this point then, all they'd asked for in return was a little respect and recognition. Of course, any such respect had been thrown out the window in 1980 as far as they were concerned when Proposition 2 and a half was passed. And even if those who had lost their jobs would eventually be offered them back as a result of new emergency funding, this would still take a while to get in place. So during the intervening time, a feeling began to develop amongst many of those who had been let go that this was only a means of temporarily placating them and that they were never going to get their jobs back at all. Why would they trust that the city had their welfare and best interests in mind, given what they had already done to them? Maybe what was needed them, some of them reasoned, was a wake-up call. Sure, the fires of five years prior had been disastrous, but if even that wasn't enough to secure the jobs of emergency services without the need for last-minute intervention, and if that last-minute intervention may never actually come about as far as they were concerned, then perhaps an even bigger wave of arsons would grab people's attention. And we say people's attention here as we're not just referring to local politicians who passed the bill, but also the general public who voted it into action. The very public who the fire department had spent so much of their time and energy, not to mention risking their lives, to protect. 
So starting in February of 1992, an increasing number of arson attacks would be reported throughout the city. But while Boston had already lived through a situation like this before, even it wasn't prepared for the full scope of how bad things would get here because, by the summer, so many fires had been reported. It was beginning to make the numbers from 1977 look tame by comparison. And despite the emergency services already having a number of staff brought back by this point, they were still struggling to keep up with the calls they were getting as, even if their numbers were due to continue to increase as more people returned. Budget cuts still meant that 22 of the fire departments across the city remained closed down and their supplies kept out of use. The emergency funding instigated by city officials may have been enough to start the process of offering emergency service workers their jobs back, but it wasn't enough to ensure that all of the equipment they needed, both physical and technological, could be kept up to date and in working order. With things being stretched thin and firefighters often having to work around the clock so as to battle the seemingly constant array of blazes around the city, it meant that, inevitably, mistakes would be made and as a result, people would end up getting injured. And that's not to say injuries can't occur at any time when tackling situations like these because as everyone knows, it's an environment where a person can very quickly die if they don't know how to handle the situation correctly. Even with the threat of getting hurt being a hazard of the job, the sheer amount of fires meant that the amount of injuries amongst those helping to deal with the numerous arson attacks would be very high, higher than had ever been seen before. So bad did it get, in fact, that by July, Boston was gaining a reputation for being the new arson capital of the world. And this would even lead to then-District Chief Paul V. McCarthy being forced to make a public statement about the situation when he confirmed that, of all the fires which had broken out over that period, around 50% of them had been classified as arson. What was his explanation for that at the time? Well, he argued that the demographic shifts which had taken place within the city during its recent history could be partially to blame. After all, with a number of higher-income families moving out to the suburbs and leaving their former homes behind, it had led to a lot of areas which were once thriving now becoming far more low-income in their citizenry. Of course, it should be noted that this low-income situation was part of a larger vicious cycle, where those people living in such economic circumstances would often find it incredibly difficult to get out of it. This was because their opportunities were generally pretty limited when it came to things like gaining employment, meaning they would often have to turn to other methods in order to make a living. That was why so many living in areas like East Boston, South Boston, and Roxbury at the time had turned to crime to feed themselves. And it was also why the increased amount of arson attacks in these areas, particularly throughout 1982, were initially explained away by some as being a mere side effect of this. It didn't, however, do much to explain the fact that there were also clearly a number of arson attacks taking place in other parts of the city as well. But with everyone looking for a possible answer at that point, it's easy to see how they fell upon this as being a possible solution, even if it was a tenuous one. And as we know now, the rise in arsons at this point did have a lot to do with economic opportunities within the city during this period. It wasn't a result of low-income families living in the area turning to crime and torching buildings. No, it was the very people who were supposed to be protecting them who were turning to crime. I'm sure that most of you listening to this know what arson is, but for those who are unclear, arson is, in a legal sense, defined as being an incident where a person without a lawful excuse decides to willfully and maliciously destroy or damage a property with fire. Basically, if you set fire to a building on purpose, then you're committing arson, and as such, in the eyes of the law, you're committing a pretty major crime. One of the most common reasons someone will commit arson is for insurance fraud. Like when a person owns a business which is struggling and they try to burn down their place of work as to claim the money back. Of course, this is only one example of why such an act might take place, and in other instances, it can also range from things like revenge against an enemy by trying to destroy their home, to outright attempts at murder when there are people in the building at the time. When it came to the arson attacks that were taking place in Boston at this time, none of these explanations seemed to fit the situation, at least not on the face of things. While there could have been arguments made that some of the fires may have been related to insurance fraud, the vast majority were quickly ruled out when it came to this as the targeted sites were largely abandoned or disused buildings. 
As far as other higher profile targets which were hit, such as factories, warehouses, restaurants, and even churches in the local area, there was nothing discovered during the subsequent investigations to suggest there were any attempts at committing any type of fraud. So with insurance fraud being ruled out as a primary motive, the next best potential reason appeared to be revenge. Unfortunately for investigators, though, while revenge or attempted murder against those who owned the properties in question couldn't be outright disproven in many cases, the sheer volume of the fires around the city made it unlikely that this would be the predominant reason. This left the investigators struggling to come up with a modus operandi for whoever the perpetrator of the crimes were, or even if this was the work of one organized group at all. After all, back in 1977, the rise in arson cases had not been the result of a single collective. It had just been a series of non-connected cases which all happened to occur at around the same time. With this situation though, even if there was no hard evidence to suggest there was a connection between all of the blazes which had taken place over the preceding months, many in law enforcement still had a nagging feeling that there was something different here and that there may indeed be a single group to blame. For one, many of the arson attacks followed a similar pattern, with the fires usually being set sometime between midnight and 6 a.m. where there would be minimal witnesses around. And in terms of how they were started, the perpetrators would almost always rely on a time delay incendiary device consisting of a paper lunch bag filled with lantern fuel and tissue paper placed inside of a small Ziploc bag, with this then being lit either by an interlaced matchbook or a lit cigarette. In addition to that, many of the incidents would happen within the same areas within a matter of days. Over one weekend in June, in fact, fires in the double digits would break out, leading to all 225 of the active firefighters on duty in Boston at the time being overwhelmed as they were called out simultaneously. So bad did it get at this point, with a full 133 calls being made to the fire department over the course of one single night, help would have to be pulled in from fire departments in neighboring towns and cities, with a full 22 neighboring areas at one time sending an additional 31 companies in to assist with the fight. Combined with the fact that many of these same lower income areas kept getting hit, only further emphasized the need for something to be done before things got even further out of control. As then Deputy Fire Chief Joseph Claspie would put it himself when discussing the weekend the arson cases got to their worst, quote, it was terrible, the worst in the 31 years of my experience. By June, places like Dorchester, Jamaica Plain, and Charlestown would be amongst the worst affected by the wave of fires, something which was particularly hard for them to recover from as they were amongst the most low-income areas of the city. With some of the buildings there not necessarily having the same level of safety precautions instituted during their construction, it meant that, once a blaze did take hold, it could quickly get very bad and even spread to other buildings. As was the case when a fire at a YMCA in Dorchester jumped to a nearby dental office and burned that to the ground too. At least this dental office was closed at the time the flames spread there because, while most of the fires were started in empty or disused buildings, suggesting the criminals at hand weren't trying to actively injure anyone, others spread to occupied buildings and forced them to undergo emergency evacuations. This only made the problem that much worse as, by the time fall hit, it wasn't uncommon for every available unit to be out fighting fires at any given time often being sent to blazes that were nine alarm or worse. In fact, so swamped was the fire department in Boston, help would have to travel up to 25 miles on a regular basis in order to cover incidents where there was no one else available nearby. Of course, with this came the inevitable injuries that firefighters would suffer in the line of work, with the medical bills which came out of these, as well as the damage caused by the fires themselves, quickly racking up debts in the millions for the people of Boston. And we're not just talking about a couple of million dollars here either, because in one night alone, $700,000 worth of damage was caused, giving a sense of just how big of a problem this was becoming for the city of Boston and the state of Massachusetts. By the time it got to November, the total destruction which had been racked up would cost the city a staggering $22 million, with one fire at the Sparrow Toy Company on June 3rd creating $13 million worth of damage alone and ending with 31 firefighters being injured. Obviously, it became imperative that whoever was carrying out these attacks had to be stopped and stopped quickly. At this point, police were still stumped when it came to locating any clues which might guide them towards a suspect in the crimes. But who could blame them? After all, 
they were unable to do something as simple as carry out tests on the incendiary devices they'd found at the scenes of some of the fires, as the makeshift nature of the devices made them particularly hard to analyze for clues, especially after they'd inevitably been doused with water. Things seemed pretty bleak, and by now the citizens of Boston were beginning to worry about when they might be affected by one of the sea of fires going on every night. Luckily, the first real clue would come soon after this when an anonymous letter was sent to a local television station in Boston, claiming to be from the arsonists themselves. As this letter would put it, the attacks were indeed being carried out by an organized group of people, and they were being done with the intention of holding the city ransom. What exactly was the ransom here? Well, it wasn't money, and it wasn't political influence. No, it was the reactivation of all firefighting and police equipment which had been put out to pasture during the budget cuts of the prior year, as well as a speedier timeline for all emergency service workers getting their jobs back. While many of the staff who were let go in each of these services had been offered their jobs back by this point, there were still a lot who hadn't. On top of that, as was mentioned earlier, even those who were back were struggling to do their jobs to the best of their abilities as they no longer had access to some of the equipment they had before. This must have been extremely frustrating for them as all they wanted to do was to protect people, and in hindsight it should have made it obvious that, based on the contents of the letter which had been sent out to the media, the whole thing was an inside job. But with city officials perhaps being hesitant to believe this was the case, as they may not have wanted to deal with the inevitable blowback such a situation would bring about, they looked for other explanations in the meantime. This meant looking into the letter itself in more detail for any further clues it may have been holding. Investigators noted that it was addressed as being from a Mr. Flair, or, as he claimed the authorities already knew him, Friday Firebug. It was highly likely that this was a pseudonym, of course, but the police followed up on it anyway, on the off chance it was an actual name. Unfortunately, though not surprisingly, it wouldn't match up with anyone in the city records, and they wouldn't be able to assess the handwriting either, as the whole thing had been made up with cut-out letters from newspapers and magazines pasted onto a blank sheet of paper, like you'd see in the movies. On top of that, no fingerprints could be found on the letter, suggesting its creator was smart enough to wear gloves while making it. But while it appeared to suggest there was only one man responsible for the waves of fires across the city, the authorities remained confident that this wasn't the case and that instead, Mr. Flair was actually the spokesperson for a larger group. The idea that a single person could do so much damage in such a short span of time across an entire city without ever getting caught seemed implausible. The damage had now gotten so severe for Boston that the whole thing would later be labeled by U.S. District Judge Zobel as an act of domestic terrorism, and it seemed that there was an element of maliciousness now being added to the whole thing too, as around this point it would come to light in the New York Times that fire alarm boxes had been stolen from a number of the arson sites. This meant that the fire department would often not be notified of there being an issue until it was far too late to save the building. It also indicated that whoever was doing this had, at least to some degree, knowledge of the processes behind fire notification. With things only getting worse and worse, it felt like eventually something had to give, and the situation would arguably reach its peak when during a blaze which broke out at a disused military barracks on July 24th, the roof would collapse while the fire department were there battling the flames. That ended up leading to 22 members of the fire department being seriously injured as a result, with two of them suffering permanent disabilities after the fact. Unfortunately, that would only be another statistic to add to the pile at this point, because by then, almost 300 firefighters had been hurt since the arson started in February. Luckily, though, a breakthrough in the case would eventually come when, at one fire which took place not long after the barracks incident, a TV cameraman who was on the scene spotted something suspicious. He was a local cop named Robert Grabluski, waving his gun in the air towards a number of his colleagues, almost as if in celebration. While this could have easily been put down to being a simple case of miscommunication, or of the cameraman reading more into an innocent action than was actually there, the authorities were so desperate for any morsel of a lead at this point that they followed up on it immediately. While Robert was now being treated as a suspect, there was no formal evidence they could use to arrest him for arson, meaning the investigators would have to bide their time and hope something presented itself. 
And luckily it would, when, upon discovery that Robert may have been involved in the theft of car parts, they were able to bring him in under these charges in the summer of 1984. People questioned the validity of the charge, but it gave the cops the excuse they needed to sit him down and begin questioning him. While they had their suspect in an interrogation room, they would also be able to press him for information he may or may not have regarding the wave of arson attacks which had gripped the city. Initially, Robert would deny any first-hand knowledge of who was committing the crimes and argued that he certainly had nothing to do with it himself. After hours of questioning, he would eventually break and admit that, yes, he was part of a collective who had been starting fires all over Boston throughout 1982. As to who the others were in this group, he informed investigators that their ranks included Donald Stackpole, Greg Bemis, Wayne Sandin, Ray Norton Jr., Joseph Gorman, Leonard Kendall Jr., and Christopher Damon, all of whom either worked for the police or the fire department or were well-known firebugs in the area, with this referring to people who liked to watch fires and collect firefighting memorabilia. With names now being named, there was nothing to stop Robert from explaining the reason why he and his cohorts had carried out the crimes. Unsurprisingly, it all centered on Proposition Two and a Half. At least in the case of the early fires, these had been started with the hopes that a rise in arson crimes would convince the state to bring back all the firefighters and police officers who had been laid off as part of the budget cuts. Of course, when this started to happen, however, they didn't stop. Why? Well, because they wanted more, and that included not only a faster return of all released workers, but also full funding to be returned to the emergency services, allowing them to get back to the level they were at before Proposition 2.5 had been passed. And if that didn't work, the hope amongst the arsonists was that the wave of fires would simply scare the citizens of Boston so much they'd choose to vote for a change in the laws themselves. After all, it was them who were at risk the most, and if they didn't have the right public services to keep protecting them, then who knew how much worse things might eventually get. While it's easy to see the logic in there as more emergencies would necessitate more emergency service workers being hired, the group who had committed themselves to starting fires all over Boston didn't seem to care about any of the collateral damage which came about as a result of this. No one was outright killed in any of these fires, and as they themselves would later state, they had made attempts to make sure the buildings they torched were empty ahead of time. By the point of their capture, hundreds had been injured, in some cases very badly, and a lot of businesses had been hurt beyond repair when fires spread to their buildings and destroyed them too. Needless to say, despite them each feeling like they were doing it with the best of intentions, there was little sympathy to be had, either publicly or amongst their peers, once the whole thing leaked out to the media. At this point, more details about the crimes would become known to everyone, with it being revealed that all eight of the original group members had met at a private club within the city where firebugs were known to congregate and share stories. From there, they had come up with a plan to get Massachusetts to fund them fully again by starting a spree of arsons the likes of which had never been seen before. At first, they were cautious about this, not wanting to get caught before their goals could be achieved. So with this in mind, they started off relatively small, using their work gear to access an abandoned building in late 1981 without suspicion, then setting a fire to the building using a homemade incendiary device they had dubbed La Bomba. With their plan working, they'd begun executing their plan fully, taking things to another level entirely during the summer months after becoming fully emboldened on account of the fact that they hadn't been discovered. At this point, they had even taken to driving to and from the scenes of their crimes in a car which was specifically purchased because it looked like a police cruiser, and it had a vanity plate that read, Arson. If that seems a little brazen, it wasn't, because as far as they were concerned, it made them look like officials investigating the situation to any casual passerby. And their care to not get caught wouldn't end there, because, as Robert Grabluski would later go on to state, the group had also been responsible for starting blazes in nine surrounding cities and towns too, all in the hopes that this might throw any investigators off their trail. They still couldn't help themselves from occasionally enjoying their own handiwork, though, 
That's why, at various points, members of the group would remain on the scene after the fires had been started in order to quietly celebrate amongst each other, again, all while being able to stay relatively unseen on account of the fact that they were wearing their uniforms. As we all know now, though, it would be this arrogance which would ultimately get them caught. And had they not gotten caught, it seemed unlikely that they would have stopped until the state finally caved and restored full funding to all emergency services in Massachusetts. Despite the worst of the fires having ended in November of 1982, it's believed by many that the Boston arsonists were still responsible for a number of fires which took place up until the time of their eventual capture in 1984. This can't be confirmed because the men involved would remain tight-lipped about when exactly things had drawn to a close. Perhaps because by this point, they realized that the more they admitted to, the more jail time they would end up serving. Even if they didn't want to reveal any more, by now investigators had all the evidence required to arrest them. So soon after this, an 83-count federal indictment would be thrown down at the nine men involved, with this being described by the New York Times as the largest single arson case in history, state or federal, in terms of the number of fires involved. This meant that, due to the magnitude of the crimes and the anger from the public remaining palatable, there was little hope that any of them were going to get out of this one without a long prison sentence. A number of them would plead not guilty at first, but this was to be expected, and it was largely assumed that they would eventually be found culpable before things were all said and done. Of course, in order to make sure they didn't try to flee before they could have their day in court, those amongst the nine who were deemed to be the highest flight risks were held without bail, with these individuals including Donald Stackpole, Greg Bemis, and Wayne Sandin. On top of that, Ray Norton's bail would be set at a staggering $50,000, a high amount for the time, with Joseph Gorman still being high overall but lower in the total of $25,000. Clearly, it was assumed by the courts that the likelihood was that these men would attempt to run if they had the chance as they were all too aware of the evidence against them. And with this evidence ready and waiting to be presented to the court, once the trial began, most believed that everything that needed to be uncovered had already been uncovered and that things wouldn't go on for too long. But while the trial was relatively short, that wasn't to say there weren't more revelations to come out. In fact, in direct contradiction to the Robin Hood-like nature the arsonists portrayed themselves as having, forcing the hands of those in power to act on behalf of the downtrodden and unemployed, things weren't quite as cut and dry as that. For the most part, the actions of the nine defendants had been, at least in their minds, a justified and altruistic move, something which was done for the greater good of the city and its people. This hadn't been true of every crime they committed, though, because as the trial went on, it would come to light that some of the fires had been started as a means of gaining profit, with the perpetrators using these incidents to collect on insurance claims. On top of that, there were examples of fires being started by the group which appeared to have been done for no other reason than to gain revenge over someone who had gotten on their bad side in the past. Take for example one incident where the Boston Sparks Association was torched. As it would later come out in court, the reason this had been done had nothing to do with getting support for firefighters. No, it had been carried out because two members of the arson ring had previously been denied membership there. Another building, which was owned by the client of a security company two of the arsonists worked for, would also be targeted specifically. Though in this particular incident, the motive wouldn't be revenge, but distraction as it was hoped that this would rule them out as being potential suspects if they had a vested interest in the place not being burned to the ground. Of course, these examples don't necessarily negate what they saw as the positive aspects of their fight, but it does go to show that, even within this misguided ethos, the rot had already started to set in as they were slipping in less noble attacks here and there, perhaps in the hopes that these would be swept up and forgotten in the larger conversation they were hoping to create. Had they been able to go on for longer without getting caught, it's likely this rot would have only infested things more. After all, a firebug member of their ranks, Donald Stackpole, would reveal during his trial that he would never had any real interest in committing acts of moral protest when he joined up with the group and that he had lied about his intentions in order to get a foot in the door with them. As far as he was concerned, firefighters and cops were overpaid and underworked and didn't deserve the status of heroes to the public they had bestowed upon them. 
So for him, being involved in the arsons was merely a way of harassing the emergency services and making their lives a living hell for as long as possible. When his associates realized that they had a wolf amongst them the entire time, it gave some of them pause for thought as they began to reassess what they had been doing. And perhaps this was what led to many of them starting to divulge more information as the trial went on. Even if they were more open to cooperating with the courts at this point, it didn't do much to soften the punishment which was ultimately coming their way because by then they'd already managed to add further crimes to the pile. Earlier in the trial, a number of the defendants had allegedly tried to obstruct the course of justice by threatening potential witnesses and even attempting to destroy evidence. In fact, at one point, Stephen E. Higgins, the director of the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and the man who was leading the prosecution's investigation, would claim that his life was threatened. This, combined with the sheer scale of what had occurred across Boston during the prior few years, would lead to him labeling the case the most frightening and bizarre criminal conspiracy he'd ever seen. This is a man who had dealt with crime on the highest scale in the past. So for him to look at this case as being the one which struck fear into his heart the most, it goes a long way towards describing just how badly these arsons had scarred the city. It would take a long time for the people there to get over what had happened as, even with the perpetrators now on trial, there was still a sense that things could easily go wrong and that the fires could start up all over again at any point if any copycats decided to pick up the baton. Wanting to put the whole thing in the past as quickly as possible in order to let the healing begin, the prosecution got to work convincing the jury that the nine men involved were indeed guilty of the various charges set against them. Given the temperature of Boston at the time and the overwhelming evidence against them, it didn't take long for the jury to bring a guilty verdict down on all of those involved. Based on what they'd seen throughout the trial, the perpetrators had shown little regard for anyone who might get hurt as a result of their actions. In fact, the way it came across in court, they appeared to have enjoyed doing what they were doing after a certain point, with it eventually becoming less about making a political statement and more about having a game of cat and mouse with the authorities. This suggested that Donald Stackpole had a far greater impact on the group than the others were at least initially willing to let on, and it also suggested that, in the end, they'd lost sight of anything good they felt they were doing as they slid further and further down the rabbit hole of bitterness toward the city and its inhabitants. This was what led to each of the figures involved being sentenced to time in prison, with the length of these sentences varying depending on the level of involvement they had. For those like Christopher Damon and Joseph Gorman, who were only charged with aiding and abetting the rest of the gang, they got off relatively light with five years inside of a state penitentiary. As for others such as Greg Bemis and Wayne Sandin, however, they received far heavier sentences on account of the fact that they were deemed to not only be directly involved with the arsons, but also the subsequent threatening of witnesses and attempted obstruction of justice. They were sentenced to 20 years behind bars. The same would apply for Donald Stackpole as well, with him appearing to have no motive other than to act as an agent of chaos around the city. He was also sentenced to 20 years in prison. When it came to Robert Grabluski, even if he was the one who had first spilled the details to investigators after getting caught, this didn't really do much to help soften the blow which would be dealt against him. With the courts determining that he was the ringleader of the whole group, the one who first broached the idea and gathered everyone involved together, he was sentenced to a maximum of 40 years in prison. While this would mark the end of the Boston arson spree, it would take a long time for things to recover fully as, even if the men involved were now behind bars, the panic and fear would remain for a while. Even though over time, things would get better as people healed, the emergency services would continue to suffer long after the fact. That was because the whole case ended up having the opposite effect of what the arsonists had intended. It caused state lawmakers to continue on the same path of tightening the purse strings as the 80s rolled on. It's not like the fire department would ever be stretched that thin again though, because by the end of the decade, cases of arson had fallen so dramatically that only around four a year were now being reported. A far cry from the multitudes that had been starting up on a nightly basis just a few years prior. If any of the citizens of Massachusetts were worried that something like this might happen again, they needn't be, at least according to a former ATF special agent who worked on the case back then. 
As he argued, the rise in cell phones, GPS, and surveillance cameras would make such an eventuality highly unlikely in this day and age. As well as that, the fact that there's been a dramatic reduction in vacant buildings throughout Boston over the decades as housing prices have risen means there are less natural targets to attack. Even if the citizens of Boston can rest easy in the knowledge that what occurred back in 1982 is never likely to take place again, the damage that was done back then will always leave some semblance of a shadow over them anyway. As U.S. District Judge Raya Zobel put it himself, quote, The consequences of the fires are, I'm not sure even now, fully tallied. That's ultimately because, at the end of the day, what the people discovered back then was that fires don't just burn the brick and mortar of a city. They burn the very soul of it as well. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline by simply dialing 988 in the United States. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you may be facing. Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can also check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our new merch at Teespring. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.